I'm going to start telling you about Federico J. Gonzalez, CEO of the Radisson Hotel Group, who is our next keynote speaker. He has a very special career. He's the CEO of the Radisson Hotel Group, which we are being hosted in here today. And um, you've had a very interesting career. Also, also, I mean, this is fantastic. Deputy General Manager of Disneyland Paris right. as well. And uh, thank you very much indeed for hosting us here in your hotel. My pleasure. And um, yesterday I saw a very happy guest, actually. He had four legs. Yes. It's good that you have pet-friendly <laughs> hotel as well. It's great to have you here. So, ladies and gentlemen, we now have our keynote on change by Federico J. Gonzalez, the CEO of the Radisson Hotel Group. Over to you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm going to make a short 30-minute uh, presentation on change. I think uh, it's great to see the private sector and the public sector thinking about tourism. And, and actually, one of the things is actually the tourism sector has been changing. We are changing now, and we need to drive even further change in the future. So I, I, as, as you have mentioned, I had the opportunity to work in Disney, uh, Land Paris, for eight years. I work in NH Hotel Group uh, for four, and I have been now seven years driving also change in Rice and Hotel Group. So what we are doing today is just sharing some of the learnings we have had as a group, and I have had as a, as a leader of the company, to stay alive, okay, throughout change, okay? The, the, the presentations are, is, is very simple, hopefully it's very clear, and we'll take you through that, okay? So what are the experiences, or what are the things that we think that has allowed us to drive change and keep alive as we have done it? And I'm going to mention five, and the five of them are pretty simple. Okay, the first one we are going to see is actually the ability to change and not only to add change, but be able, once you have defined the change, to keep adapting to what that change will require. The second one is a clear plan. I think, if not 100, 90% of the failures in change is because the plans are not good and the plans are not concrete. And that includes a diagnosis and a vision that is able to solve all the key issues that we have identified. The third one is ability to secure the right people, the right partners, and the right culture quick. The fourth is have, in our case, the consumer or the customer or the <coughs> person who vote okay, in mind always. In our case, the consumers do not vote, but they, they give their opinion. And do it always. And the fifth one is actually leadership, leadership, and leadership. So I'm going to take you now through those five, so we are clear on those five why we need to do them so we can survive and keep changing and leading the change. The first one is ability to change and adapt. This is a, a lot has been written on from psychology. So I like a lot, okay, the third book is called Why CEOs Get Fired. <clears throat> it's a very interesting book, but actually you, you don't need to read. There's only one thing that is clear out of the book is is lack of ability to change and adapt, okay? If you are not able to change and adapt as a leader, you fail, okay? It's impossible to succeed. And actually, when you drive change, this, again, this is not a chart I invented, but this is a, a very traditional <coughs> chart about change, which are the phases through in which organizations usually go. You arrive to an organization, you want to drive change. Usually, people is unaware of the need of change. People is not working eight, 10 or 12 hours thinking that they need to change. They think they're doing good. So actually what happens is they deny and actually eventually they get angry, okay? Because of that, that you are creating a need of something now you need to change. Then as people start to understand that there is a need for change. What leads to a kind of a state of depression, things are not good. Then the teams will start buying in without, accept it, buy in and then they will reach a moment where there is acceptance if there are results. If there is no results, then they will look at you and they will say, what on earth have we been doing during the last two or three years, okay? And actually, this is what I think it was before COVID. Actually, now <clears throat> there is a second phase. Let me just go to this one. This. Actually, we started the change in Radisson in 17, and everything looked like that. So we were getting results, 
between 17 and 19. We doubled the, the, the VDA and the results of the company. But then now COVID came and what happens is there are drops because what we thought it was good and perfect, we need to adapt, but there are nearly two years where the company has no revenues. It doesn't matter how brilliant you are. It doesn't matter how good you are as a team. With two years without revenues, you cannot make profits. Impossible. And what that leads you is actually, it takes you longer to see results, and there are drops in morale. Not everybody is able to keep the same level of positive attitude during such a long period of time. What that leads you to is to spend more time with personal coaching, with support, and find energy boosters. And that doesn't mean a drink, but obviously means that you need to bring good news even in those kind of situations. And then one critical thing in this ability to change is when you start changing a company, you need to be aware that not everybody is in the same phase as you drive change. You start to see something, you make a diagnosis, you make an analysis, but in our case, we, have, we are a company with more than 100,000 people, so it's not easy to make sure that when you talk to everybody, everybody's in the same situation. You need to keep adapting to where you are. Some tips on the execution side, on ability to change and adapt, that we have learned, is the first one is you cannot change what you don't know very well. No matter if you are the CEO, the president, or whoever, you need to know your business better than anybody in the company. The second is that the biggest resistance to change is lack of concreteness. I personally like to write, I like to read, I like poetry, but not in business. When you drive change, you need to be extremely concrete on what you want to change. Exactly. What are the concrete things we need to change? Then the third one is nothing changes until people accept and visualize the difference. I will share with you a couple of them later on when we try to change what is the experience in hotels. And then last, very clear, you need to identify the resistance to change and help them leave quick. Okay, there is a time to understand, to move, to change, but there is a moment where people who is not ready to adapt to the change needs to leave the organization. And then the last four is nothing is impossible, health permitting. That's critical when you have change, you need to convince people that actually everything is possible. Then we are responsible of the results, not the company. And this is something that you may have experienced. It's very typical in our world or in, in any business company or in any company that people talk about the company, but actually I cannot promote the company. I cannot fire the company. I cannot increase the salary to the company. It's an individual. I always have an anecdote that I say, when I was at PNG, I worked in, P in Procter & Gamble, Portugal. And we work a lot with Porto Procter & Gamble, Spain. And there was, you know, kind of a difficult relation between Spain and Portugal those days. You know, Spain wanted to say what to do. Portugal, we were, we wanted to be independent of what the Spaniards would say. So there was a moment where in the Portuguese organization, someone was complaining about Spain. You know, I mean, it was in, in Herker division. You know, Spain is not allowing us to do something. I say, there is no Spain. Spain is 44 million people. So who in Spain is not allowing us to do it? What is the marketing director? Okay, who is the marketing director? Well, marketing director is Joao, a Portuguese guy. So actually, it was not Spain. It was, it was a very concrete person that actually didn't, were, were, was actually not a Spanish person. So we need to be extremely concrete on who. Then the world is immense, the opportunities too, and I agree with the opportunities for tourism. They are huge, okay, and they are immense. And complacency kills everything. The moment we think we are done, then we are done. Okay, so complacency kills any possibility of change. Now we move to the element two. We have said the first one is ability to change and adapt. The second one is a clear plan. And a clear plan has very few elements, and, and I know you know them all. The first one is the diagnosis. The diagnosis is the critical first element of any change, because it is what allows us to say what we need to change and what we don't need to change. It needs to tell the truth, even if it's painful. It needs to build hope. It needs to be realistic. It, it needs to include only relevant facts. And it needs to be easy to explain. When we did the diagnosis of the company, and this, no need to read the slide, even if we made more than 1,000 pages of analysis, I took to the board two pages. This one and another one like this, two pages. 
we need to be able to show to the company, to the employees, to everybody, what is the diagnosis of the company in a very easy way. Because if not, nobody understands. It's a complex company. We operate in more than 100 companies, uh, 100 countries. We have nearly 2,000 hotels. So you cannot explain what's happening in every hotel. You need to make a very easy diagnosis of what is happening. And actually, it fulfilled all the requests. It, was, it showed the truth. It built hope. It was realistic. And it was very easy to explain. Then, after the plan and after the diagnosis, it comes the vision. It's very difficult to lead change if there is not a clear vision of what we want to do. And it needs to be clear, honest, and inspiring. I usually, when I do this presentation, I always ask the teams, we'll not do it because we are many people, but can a, can a vision truly change people's attitudes? Okay, and there is always 50-50, okay? 50% 50 think it is not true, this is poetry, and this is a bit of poetry, but actually is, is, is good. And, and actually, I always put this example, okay? This is three people, they are all doing the same, they have a stone, they have a hammer, and they are hammering eight hours a day, the stone, okay? Then the first one is not very happy, the second one is okay, and the third one is extremely happy. The difference between these three people is the vision. The first one is shaping a stone. Comes every day, dad, what did you do? Mom, what were you today? You know, I spent eight hours with a hammer and a stone. Second is building a wall. Every day there is one meter more. It's another brick in the stone. It's another stone in the wall. And the third one is building a cathedral. That's memorable. That will stay forever. I go home and there is always one thing that will stay forever. So if the vision obviously needs to be relevant to you and to your business, but it is very different. So just to share with you, this is the vision we created at Radisson when we did this exercise. You know, we want to be one of the top three hotel companies in the world, the company of choice for guests, owners, and talents. And if we are successful one day, if an investor, if I ask an investor, if I ask a student, or if I ask a consumer about one hotel company, one of the three they say needs to be a Radisson. When I presented this, this vision, someone said, how many rooms it means? I don't care less how many rooms. This is not about being the largest. It is not to be the biggest. It's top of mind one of the three companies that the consumer the owners or the potential employees have in mind. It's clear, it's honest, it's inspiring, and it's very easy to deploy to everybody in the company. I mean, when, when we lead change, you talk, to, again, as I said, to the president of a, of a division, you may talk to a minister, but you, you talk to a receptionist. You talk to a lady who's cleaning rooms, and they may ask you, so what, what do you want to do of the company? You need to be able to explain that vision to absolutely anybody in the company. Then, once we have the diagnosis and we have the vision, we need a plan. And the plan needs to be complete, concrete, sufficient, and understandable. No poetry in the plan. A bit in the vision, if you wish, but never in the plan. And, and actually, that's what we did. I would not show you the 29 initiatives of our plan, but actually, our plan, and we have been using this slide for the last five years. The plan is built on portfolio management, what we do in brands and products, what we do in marketing, sales, revenue management, what we do in organization, how do we create a competitive cost advantage, how we create the best systems, and we get the right scale worldwide. That is then deployed in 29 initiatives. And everybody in the company knows extremely well what the 29 initiatives are. And I personally read the work of the 29 initiatives every quarter as we update it. That is what makes the company be extremely disciplined in executing the plan. It is complete, it's concrete, it's sufficient, and it's understandable. Once we have the, <coughs> the ability to change, we have the plan, now we go to the third element. That is actually the right people, the right partners, and the right culture. And I think on this, I always like to use, from my Disney days, you know, the villains and the heroes. Okay, as the paradox that I live every day, that you may live every day, and actually the organization is going to live when you deal with change. That is, sometimes in this change you are a villain, sometimes you are a hero. 
When I go to the board and I convince them of giving a bonus to the employees, I'm a hero to the employees who get the bonus. I'm a villain to some of the shareholders who may not like that we give, you know, or we decrease the profits. When you are discussing with one country and you say, we're not going to invest in your market, I'm going to invest in another market, you are a villain for those markets where you are not going to invest, you are a hero for those you are going to invest. And actually, this happens across all the teams. Marketing against sales, finance against uh, construction, one market or one brand versus another one. But it doesn't matter. That is going to happen with the teams, with the customers, with the shareholders. And there are three tips, okay, to make sure that at least those relations are healthy. Is always be honest, use knowledge to discuss, have the positive attitude, and deliver results. Because if you have those four things, even if sometimes you will be villain or you will be a hero, everybody will understand why you do things and why things are being done. The fourth element, sorry, and then the beliefs. We have spent a significant amount of time to write down, and I did it, this one, I, I work on that also personally with HR, to make sure that for everybody is clear what the beliefs of the company are. We deliver memorable moments. If not, we don't want you to work in the company. We enjoy serving people with a yes, I can spirit. We grow talent, and talent grow us. We are many minds, but only one mindset. We value open communication. We believe anything is possible, and we have fun in what we do. If you don't share these beliefs, don't join Radisson. We don't want to do business with you. We don't want to be partners with you. Because if we don't share beliefs, then there is a moment where our paths will go apart and it's better not to start ever. Then <clears throat> we have the fourth pillar, that in our case is the consumer. And there are two things that uh, we always are obsessed. The first one is focus on breaking stereotypes. And the second is put your money where your mouth is. This is critical for the organization because if not, they don't, th they don't know or they will not believe that we are really trying to transform the company. Let me share with you one example on breaking stereotypes. First is, you know, I, I come from a marketing background, so I'm obsessed with a consumer. And actually, if you think about a consumer, usually they have needs, they have emotions, they have stereotypes in mind, and they have wants, things they want. And actually, in my experience, what works the best is when you break a stereotype. So let me share with you an example. <clears throat> this is something that may have never happened to you, okay? But this is a couple in the waiting area of a parking in Walt Disney World. They have spent 10 hours in the park. And when they arrive to the parking, she tells him, give me the parking ticket. And he tells her, no, you got it. And she says, no, no, you got it. So he says, do you mean we don't know where the car is? Yes. And then it happens that this is the parking. So you have finished the day, and you think you're going to spend another 10 hours, right? Thinking, where on earth is the car? And actually, Disney has a method based on which, in 15 minutes, you just need to say wh what time you arrive to the parking. What's your model? And in 15 minutes, they will find your car. You can imagine what is the change, what's the stereotype you had in mind was, I was going to spend the next five, six hours, okay, just to get the car. Then your image of service of the company, it's amazing. Suddenly, that company comes, no matter what happened in the park during the day, the image is, you have broken a stereotype, and the image <coughs> really a step change. So this is what, unfortunately, we don't have them today because of delivery issues. This is one of the things we did <clears throat> on breaking the stereotypes in the receptions of all the hotels. I'm not saying that it's not good or bad. I'm not making a judgment call to eat an apple okay, when you go to the reception of a hotel. But we want the consumers to be extremely tempted. So we'll put, we put candies that actually, if you go to any hotel of the world, people will take nearly with hands. Okay, and people will come down from the room saying, I want those sweets. They're extremely unhealthy, full of sugar, so nothing that you can recommend. However, people love to have them as an exception. Or the showers. I don't know if you have ever experienced, hopefully never in Radisson now, but actually, 
You know, many times you go to the showers of a hotel and it looks like there's a gray animal that is going to attack you. And if you don't have the lights, you may think it's a snake or something like this. are awful showers that were installed 25 years ago. So we changed the whole, all the showers of the company. There was no payout. But you go to a hotel and I'm delighted that the consumer goes to the shower and says, okay, let me see if I can screw it, okay, and take it. Hopefully they are not successful. But next time they change the shower at home, they will say, what was that model of shower I had at Ramson? I love it. And again, it's changing the stereotypes of the shower of a hotel is not a nice shower. But what is very important is that this is also one of the things I mentioned at the beginning. It helps the organization see what do you mean by change. When you said we are going to take care of the consumer, we are going to change the experience, and they start seeing things like this, then this is the moment where the organization starts seeing what memorable experiences are about. Okay? And then the second one is put the money <coughs> where your mouth is. So when we said we are going to change the portfolio of the company, this is the hotel we had in Frankfurt when we came, when I came, and obviously we changed to the second one, okay, six months into the transformation of the company. That shows the company actually how you are going to invest, what do you mean by portfolio optimization, what do you mean by improving the consumer experience, and then people start believing why you can charge 10 or 50% or 20% more for a room. Second one is a room we had in Tromso, sorry, in Italian, in, in, um, in the Nordics. This is before and this is after. And this is a room we had in an amazing hotel, if you ever have the chance to go in Tromso, okay, where you can enjoy the Nordic lights. But actually, that's the first room, okay, and then how we converted the room. It's not only the effort you make to improve the revenues and, and make the portfolio change of the company. Actually, it is what makes your partners, your investors, your board, and the organization make them believe that actually change is going to happen and why now is possible to drive change and increase revenues, okay? And then the last point, I mean, as you, you recall, we said ability to change the plan, people, consumers always in mind, and the last one is leadership, leadership, and leadership. And this is an exercise we also try to do always internally. Is This is from a very easy book. I always advise it, it's very simple, but it's very clear. 21, in the Indispensable Qualities of a Leader of John Maxwell. But actually, he, he writes about all these characteristics, okay? And it's always good to ask the teams to say, what is the one or two that you need to have? If you need to choose one or two, okay? So make your exercise, okay, as, as we go. So we only can take two, okay? So should we keep any of those in the first column? Character, charisma, commitment, communication, competence, courage, discernment. You need them all. But we can only take with us two. So I would say let's not keep any. I prefer to still choose in the other two columns. Now we have focus, generosity, initiative, listening, passion, positive attitude, problem solving. Here, when you do the exercise, people tend to voice you know, problem solving, passion. Uh, but actually, let's keep generosity. Drive change, generosity. And then you have the last column, relationships, responsibility, security, self-discipline, teachability, vision, servanthood. So people tend to keep vision because I mentioned vision in the first chapter, so they say vision. So let's keep servanthood. And this is based on two definitions, okay? First one is generosity. Generosity is not to give things for free. Generosity is about looking beyond the obvious. It's about having a win-win spirit. It's promoting empathy with the customers, with the standard stakeholders and the team. And it's helping others to do more, to go beyond their limitations, to coach them, to train them, and to make sure they deliver their best. And in our case, if you, if you try to do drive change in a company with 100,000 employees, there is no way to do it if at the end you don't put everything in place so those 100,000 people can deliver more. So it's through generosity that the management team and the leaders of the company can really make sure that the change is driven. The second one is servanthood. Okay, that is a true leader serves, serves people, 
serves their basic strength, and in doing and in doing so, it will not they will not always be popular. And this is not a contest of popularity. This is a contest about what are the results, how the company delivers after three, four, or five years. <clears throat> and just to finish, when we did this, there, is a, there was a member of the team that said, actually, he discovered a world that sums it all, if you want to drive change that is greed. That is guts, resilience, initiative, and tenacity. Okay? With those four things, then we can really drive change. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, uh, thanks for being with us in Ryerson today. Enjoy the day, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Muchísimas gracias. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you so much, Federico González, CEO of the Radisson Group.